Well, hello friends. This is Father Brian at St. Luke's in Baton Rouge coming to you with the fifth video in this Fall's Rector's Reflections series. For those of you who have been joining us, you know that we've been touching on different parts of the Book of Common Prayer, uh, especially parts that I find particularly meaningful and helpful, uh, but with the ultimate goal of encouraging you to dig more deeply into this wonderful treasure that we have in the Book of Common Prayer. It can help us pray not only on Sundays, but every single day and at different times of the day. It, what a wonderful gift that we have in the prayer book. So today I want to focus on one particular prayer uh, that I find very meaningful. It is the Collect for Proper 15. The Collect for Proper 15. Now you may be saying, okay, what the heck is a Collect? And what, what do you mean by proper? Well, those are good questions. A collect is basically a short liturgical prayer uh, that can vary according to the day or the season of the church year or the occasion. And collects, they, they collect and draw together uh, themes appropriate to the day or the occasion. Uh, so you'll notice, for example, in the Eucharistic liturgy, after the collect for purity, followed typically by the Gloria during much of the, uh, of, the, of the church year, there's what's called the Collect of the Day. That's what Collect for Proper 15 is for the season after the day of Pentecost. But you'll notice like during Advent or during Lent or during Easter season, the Collect of the Day will have something to do with the themes appropriate to those parts of the church calendar year. Uh, the, the collects that come after the day of Pentecost uh, tend to be a little more general in their themes. They can, they can sort of be all over the place. Uh, but at any rate, what is a proper? Okay, collect for proper 15. Well, a proper refers to the variable parts of the Eucharistic liturgy and the daily office, the, the parts that change, that don't stay the same. Much of our liturgy does stay the same uh, Sunday to Sunday with the Eucharist, day to day with the daily offices. But then there are other things that change. I mean, think, for example, on any given Sunday, the scripture readings are different, right? I already mentioned the collect of the day. Those are different every single week. Uh, so that's what we're talking, Fan fancy liturgical language, uh, but that's basically what we're talking about here. So let's get back to the collect for proper 15, and I'm looking at the contemporary version found on page 232 in the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, if you want to follow along, page 232, uh, you can pray it with me or read it or reference it later if you choose to do so. And so what I would like to do now is to pray it with you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. Um, one overarching thing I want to note about this collect that uh, I've found meaningful over the years is it holds two very important things together about our Lord that sometimes in practice or sometimes in, in, in given theological preferences, we, we may sometimes kind of keep apart from each other, tending to emphasize one more so than the other. Uh, but this collect holds them, them together. Uh, Jesus' sacrifice, his, uh, his death on the cross, the atonement on the one hand, and his life, uh, the things that he did, his teachings, how he lived, his example. Uh, there is a tendency among Christians, some Christians, to just so hold up the atonement 
Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, I mean, it's so powerful and so central to our salvation uh, that the focus is almost exclusively on that without really talking a whole lot about the practical nuts and bolts of following Jesus' example. And then there are other Christians who don't really talk that much about the atonement, but boy, they really, really, really stress the importance of, of knowing and practicing Jesus' teachings and following his example in our daily lives. This prayer is holding both of those things together and reminds us that we need them both to be faithful disciples. I'll say a little bit more about both of those sides of the prayer that are getting held together here. Uh, but first I note uh, at the very beginning of the prayer in addressing God, uh, the prayer says, you have given your only son. Now, a point that I've made in a previous video is that if you look at any given page in the prayer book, any given prayer, any given liturgy, uh, and you know your Bible well, you may notice that almost, almost any given page of the prayer book is either directly quoting, paraphrasing, or alluding to passages of Scripture. It would actually be an interesting exercise to go through the prayer book and just jot down all the different references that seem to come to mind. Sometimes it's a direct quote. Sometimes it's just an echo. But again, on almost every single page, and that tells us something important right away, which is that not only do we listen to Scripture being read and being expounded upon and preaching in our worship, but in the prayer book, we actually pray Scripture. I think that's a really profound way that we engage and hold up uh, the importance of Scripture for how we relate to God and to each other. You have given your only son, we're told at the very beginning of this collect for Proper 15. Hmm, kind of sounds a little bit like, echoes a little bit to me, a pretty famous passage of Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. John 3, 16. Uh, maybe it's an accident. I don't know. Uh, I doubt it. But that's an emphasis here on God as a generous giver. God is so generous, he holds nothing back. He gave us everything in creation. And when everything got messed up, ultimately he gave his only son. Our fitting response is to be generous in return in our giving to God and to the work of God's church in the world. All right, so I want to get back to the way this prayer holds together those two different important parts about what it means to understand who Jesus is. Before I do that, though, I actually forgot to tell you something that I think is pretty cool about this prayer. It was originally composed for inclusion in the first Book of Common Prayer, which was released on the day of Pentecost in 1549. So it's been around for a while. Uh, pretty cool. Okay, so getting back to uh, the language of this collect, we're told that uh, it, it's holding up that uh, God has given his only son to be for us a sacrifice for sin. And again, resonance with, with scripture here. Uh, a couple of passages that come to my mind when I see this language, a sacrifice for sin. 1 John 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 2 he, meaning Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then we read in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So right there, that one simple phrase from that collect is echoing, if not deliberately, pointing uh, to those passages from the first letter of John. Okay, so we talked about a sacrifice for sin, but the collect is also saying, and also an example of godly life. We have to have both of those things together, this collect insists. An example of godly life. Now, this uh, doesn't really point necessarily to a particular verse in Scripture, but I think it does draw out something important about Jesus is uh, the way that he modeled 
what it means to live a godly life. So, for example, uh, when the disciples, a couple of them, ask Jesus for special favors, he tells them basically, uh, you know the Gentiles lord it over other people, but it's not going to be so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. That's from Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, uh, read verses 42 to 45. Uh, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. So servanthood, service to others. And then in John's Gospel, that beautiful passage on the night before uh, Jesus' passion, where he talks, uh, he he, he shows them by by what he does, what it means uh, to... Uh, to follow him by washing the disciples' feet. And he says, I've set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. I've set you an example. And the language in the Connect, an example of godly life. And we're also told, uh, or we ask rather, to be given grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work. Uh, and we basically read, particularly if we go through, say, the gospel according to John, uh, the fruits of Jesus' redeeming work, his cross, the resurrection, his new, abundant, and eternal life in fellowship with God and our neighbor. And then we're asking uh, God uh, to give us grace to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Um, Again, turning to the first letter of John, chapter 2, verse 6, whoever says, I abide in him, ought to walk just as he walked. And perhaps another biblical allusion uh, from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, verses, verse 21, uh, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. Follow daily the blessed steps of his most holy life. So to sum up, and I'm going to use a a summary of what this conch is about, by Marion Hatchett was a great liturgical scholar. This is his commentary on the American Prayer Book, if you're interested. This is how he sums up this collect. The conch explains the work of Christ and the response of the Christian. Christ came as both a sacrifice for sin on our behalf and as an example of the kind of life God expects of us. Our response is thanksgiving for those benefits, issuing in a daily endeavor to follow in his steps. In order to make this response, we pray for God's grace. I hope you found that a meaningful reflection. Uh, Feel free to offer your own thoughts, your own reflections, questions, and comments. Would love to hear from you, and I hope you'll join us again next Sunday for what will be the sixth uh, session of our Rector's Reflection Series. In the meantime, uh, please know of my love for you, my prayer for us all, that soon we will be able to all come back together again in person without restriction, uh, and know that uh, I'm praying for all of you. I covered your prayers as well. Be well, and God bless.